forgot I could take that off. Greg forgets his mic, and I forget I could take my mask off. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you. Um, we're especially thankful if you're joining us online. Uh, we've been making our way through a, a preaching series that's really a reading series that the congregation has been reading passages of Scripture uh, from the Old Testament paired with um, insights in the New. And uh, we just finished reading through Deuteronomy, so I don't have a passage from Deuteronomy today, but um, I was reflecting as I was looking at the text for this week and thinking about how um, different um, the preaching has been the last several weeks as we walk through Deuteronomy. Um, really, a conversation I had with Steve early on kind of set the tone for that because it became apparent to me. I just felt convicted as Moses was issuing this second sort of law, the restatement of the law of God to the people of Israel as they're about to enter the promised land and have to carry out these instructions to conquer it, to move into it and to possess it, um, it became just overwhelming to my mind that we're called to live in the promised land now. Even though we're on our way um, and waiting for the Lord to, to come and claim us and take us with him, we're called to be conquerors of this world um, in a very real and powerful way and to be evangelists, good news speaking people taking possession of the world that rightfully belongs to God and that he has extended to us this invitation to be his people present in this world. And it's an interesting thing to think about the reality that we're supposed to be driving out the enemies of God. And, and that's a unique thing to my brain because the enemies that we're facing are not flesh and blood. And it's so tempting to think of it that way. You see, I, I remember um, in one of my conversations with Steve, I've always been so disappointed with the Israelites as they got ready to enter the promised land because I knew what they were going to do. I knew the story, that they were not going to drive the, the people that lived there out, the ones that were worshiping false gods. They were not going to remain faithful to the Lord. And yet, I'm not sure that we're great at good news speaking. And so my disappointment with them turned a little bit into disappointment in myself. Because we know the mission that we have been called to. And yet it is so easy for us to back away from that. To not engage in that. To be frustrated with the Israelites who, if only they had known better, then how much better their world would be. Well, maybe we have to recognize in ourselves that if we only knew better. If only we would do better. The world would be a much different place. Our enemy is not flesh and blood. It's not the people around you. In fact, those are the ones held hostage. They're the ones in bondage to the spirit of the age whose hearts and minds have been darkened. And they don't see. They're blind. They need to see, to come to an understanding of the rescue that has been offered to them. The rescue that comes at the hand of Jesus, the one who is greater than Moses. And so the contrast between those two images of Jesus and the kingdom of God advancing in the world around us and Moses sending the people of Israel in to conquer the land, Jesus is greater than Moses. Moses was unable to go. And Jesus has never left us. And that is something we need to hold on to. And it reframes a little bit of the gospel story for me. As I was thinking and reflecting about Moses issuing this law and encouragement to the people to remain faithful to God. And I wanted us to read these words from Matthew that um, for most of my life in Churches of Christ, um, this is an important passage of scripture to us. And yet I'm not sure that we pause and reflect on it. That if, if these are the um, marching orders that we're under... Do we really think about it very often? 
Jesus speaks in Matthew 28 and says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Deuteronomy helped me see this different picture of the mission of the church in this place, in this world. And I've tried um, to be faithful. I've encouraged Steve to hold me accountable to this, that I've tried as I've been preaching through this Deuteronomy series to help the church think about the triumphant living that we're called to in a dark time. Yes, I'm, I'm not pretending that it's not dark out there. I'm not pretending that it's uh, not difficult and overwhelming and tiring and discouraging, but we are called to be the messengers of hope. That's the calling of the church. We're the messengers of Christ, the one, all those judges in the Old Testament that had to show up to rescue the Israelites who didn't do what they were supposed to do, all those judges that show up, they're all pale imitations of the Savior who we, we serve, this one who rescues and saves. I want to... Um, begin, if you were doing the reading series this week, I want to start this morning with the passage that we were invited to read sort of last. But I believe that this is the call to the church, uh, the call to you to live your life in a very powerful way. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we, are out, if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, I believe this passage of Scripture isn't simply about the Apostle Paul or the people that were traveling with him. I believe, much like I believe the story of Abraham, is a call to me about leaving behind the world I have always known and following after God in obedience to a land I have no right to enter, but that I am promised will be my home. Just like I believe that story, I believe that this passage of Scripture is calling me, calling the church, calling you to be an ambassador for Christ. Living in a hostile world, controlled by an enemy opposed to the authority of God. And our mission is to offer hope, good news, to those that are held captive by the enemy of God. In a very real sense, you and I are living in occupied territory, East Germany, 1961. Some of you remember that? 
when the wall went up and hope died? Or Afghanistan, September 1st, 2021. This is where we live. We don't sometimes engage in that, but we are living in hope in a dark time, and our job is to offer the hope that we have to the world around us. Because we know, we know what it is to fear God. That's the language Paul uses. We fear God, not the powers of this world. We are not detoured by the things that we see out there because our confidence is in the power of God. And we do not have to fear God the, once, the way we once did. He is not a punishing God. He is a loving God who has reconciled us to himself through his son, Jesus Christ. The entire context of Paul's message about fearing God in this passage is all about, we believe in the one who died for all. And so all can live because the one, Jesus, who rose from the dead. This is at the heart of, of what we believe. Jesus, because of Jesus, our sins are no longer counted against us. He became sin for us so that we could become the righteousness of God. That's what we believe. And so I want to try to arm you one more time with a little bit of truth. Truth that you probably already know but I think we need to be reminded of again as we attempt to carry out our mission. These reminders through the last several weeks only work if you decide to talk and share your faith. Otherwise, they just become, good job, a boy, and never produce anything. So I want to challenge you one more time that we are the hope that the world needs you see, the truth is, I think humanity does in fact know that it's under a curse. I think they actually know that. I think they actually know that it's the curse of sin. <clears throat> because you see, I don't have to convince them of that. I serve a God who is able to convict the hearts and minds. But I believe that they know. I've, I have encouraged you to try to use slightly different language than walking up and saying, hey, you're a sinner. Because usually that term... Sinner shuts down conversation. And so I've tried to encourage you to say words like rebellion, hate, hurt, loss, suffering, destruction, pollution, selfishness, and rejection of God. You see, the world knows that suffering exists all around us. They even know why it exists. People refuse to do the right thing. That's why suffering happens. Oh, yes, we disagree on what the right thing is. But instead of trying to fix all the things that we already disagree about, try to find the thing we agree on. People who refuse to do the right thing cause other people to suffer. They'll agree on that. You see, when we do the wrong thing, evil things, we produce a sort of human pollution and disease that infects the world around us. I'm willing to bet you can get most people to go, yeah. And people know that the message of the world, this message that um, it reinforces this idea really, the message of the world's religions um, is that you need to find a solution to the problem of sin, of suffering, of hurt, of all of that pollution. And whether um, that is atonement, you see, they even sometimes use the language that is our language. But they might not exactly describe it as atonement the way we would. Some people talk about needing to clean your aura or to balance out your karma. You see, the religions of the world offer a path 
of sacrifice to offer for sin. Even humanism and scientific religions like evolution. I tell my students all the time that is a religious belief because it orders your life. That's what religions do. You see, even humanism and scientific religions offer an atonement path to deal with the sin of humanity. Now, this week, I would love to talk about that sometime, Bill, but I can't get into it right now. You're just going to have to trust me. They, they do. This week, we were invited to read about a Jewish festival uh, of faith practice from the past, a system of atonement that was uh, given to the Jews that obviously points us to Jesus. And here was the text that you were invited to read from Leviticus. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourself and not do any work, whether native-born or an alien living among you. Because on this day, atonement will be made for you to cleanse you. Then before the Lord, you will be clean from all your sins. It is a Sabbath of rest, and you must deny yourself. It is a lasting ordinance. The priest who is appointed anointed and ordained to succeed his father as high priest is to make atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make atonement for for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting and the altar, and for the priests and all the people of the community. This is the festival of Yom Kippur, and it was celebrated this last week. But it shows up in lots of worldviews. It's all over the place. And, in fact, it's even found in cancel culture. I hate cancel culture, but I do appreciate that the humanistic worldview practices such a thing. Because, you see, if you've been canceled, you need to make atonement for your sin. Until you change, you can't play. See, even humanism has a path for atonement. There are some things that you just can't be forgiven for. Nope. Never. Isn't that ironic in a world that's all about tolerance and acceptance? That they're arming you with the conversation you need to be able to have with them. Aren't there some things that are just unforgivable? Oh, yes. See, this shows up everywhere. Sin. Sacrifice. Atonement and second chances. The world around you will understand even these words from Isaiah that we were asked to read. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, Then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. See, you have to champion the cause of the oppressed. Those that don't have need to be given some of what you have. The world understands this language. They just don't know the rest of the story You see, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in the sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be a well-watered garden like a spring whose waters never fail. You see, unless you turn to God, there is no solution for the suffering and oppression of the world around us. But humanity at least does know this. There's not like a single day, a passing moment of reflection that is going to bring about the healing that is needed. Most people wouldn't think 24 hours will solve the problem. You see, we need to be a better people at speaking and talking about the things that we believe and try to help them understand. And we have to talk in ways that they're inclined to already hear and understand. Oppression, suffering, hunger. You see, when we do that, 
we can have a conversation about some of those things that are just unforgivable. Because saying sorry doesn't always make it okay, does it? I'm sorry. So I get my second chance. You see, the world around you has become an increasingly intolerant place that doesn't believe that simply saying sorry is enough. Oh man, we're almost where we need them to be. And all we're doing is borrowing their thoughts, their beliefs. We just have to get better about speaking about Jesus and the hope that we have. Because what we believe, church, in case you don't know this, what Christians believe is very, very, very different than everybody else. What the world believes in is is so different than what Christianity teaches that we have to get better about it. So I want you to go back to this passage that we started with. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. You see, this is what we would describe as judgment day. But in the context of the verse that we read, it's not exactly that. You see, because everybody lives their life before God right now. And it's why our hearts are always so heavy when we engage in any sort of behavior that we know is wrong. Because we're already being condemned by the law of God. An eternal, unchanging, unbending law by a God who has ordered the universe around us. Humans know, we know that we are each responsible for our bad choices. And it's why we spend so much time making sure when we do something wrong that we blame others. And we deflect. Because we feel the burden of our wrong. And so if I can deflect some of the hurt and suffering and sorrow that I feel by blaming others... Trying to say, I'm not really responsible. They did, but we know we are. We know we are. And we also know that we each individually have to account for what we have done that's wrong. And like I said, I hate cancel culture, but man, it gives you a chance to talk about it. No, no, you can't just say someone else did something to you, and take an excuse. No, no, you hurt a lot of people, and you have to make it right. That's the message of the world right now. It saturates everything we hear and see. You can't just say, I was hurt and I was broken, so please forgive me for what I did. No, 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 you have to go away for a long time until you change. Until you atone. And what if there is a God? What if you could just ask that question to somebody discussing the wrongs in the world? Well, what if there is a God? What if, in fact, all the people who have ever lived and are alive right now, like 99% of humanity, that all time... What if they're right and there actually is some great power beyond everything you see? What do you do then? How do you make your wrongs right with the universe? That's the way they would describe it. You just get to change that and say, God. How do you make your wrongs right with God? So I'm going to let you in on a secret, everybody. I can't. I can't make my wrongs right. I would need Doc Brown's time machine. I'd have to go back in time and punch myself in the head before I did it. Because once it's done, you see, the world will agree here. Once the action is done, it's done. And saying sorry just doesn't make it okay. So I cannot actually atone 
for the wrong that I have done. Do you guys believe that? Okay, well, you agree with most of the world then, and you think you have nothing to talk about how to share Christ with them and how to lead them to Jesus. You see, it's exactly what we all believe. It doesn't matter how much trash I go pick up or how many homes I build for the homeless or how much money I donate to a good cause. You see, the people that I have wronged, I have wronged and I cannot make it okay. Sorry isn't good enough. I cannot restore my righteousness. And that, friends, is why I need Jesus. Because I need him to be my righteousness. But now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so that so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. I have a choice. You see, cancel culture tells me this. The world wants me to go away until I can somehow reclaim my righteousness, my worth. But my actions are what leads to me needing forgiveness. My poor choices and my dumb mistakes. I am a person in need of being rescued. And I cannot do it myself. No matter how hard I've tried. And I'll bet you in a quiet moment, in a conversation with somebody, you could get them to admit to themselves that they have tried. And they keep failing. And they know they need the rescue. You see, all of the religions of the world, pretty much, I'm sorry, it's going to sound offensive. Well, you're just stupid. Try again. Learn more. Do better. Try again. Try again. It doesn't work. And Christianity is different. This is why we have to be careful sometimes when we talk. We put stumbling blocks in front of people. You see, Christianity is different. I'm counted righteous at the start. Not because of my actions, but because of the one who died for me. That's what we believe. We believe that our forgiveness is because of Jesus. We believe that our righteousness is because of Jesus. We believe that we are restored because of Jesus. Everything we believe about being made right with God is because of Jesus. And the text over and over again will tell us that this is a free gift of God, that God is no longer counting your sins against you, your wrongdoings. I have to accept Jesus. How do I do that, church? Have have you spent enough time in church to know how to answer that question for somebody? Well, how do you accept Jesus? Now be careful that you don't trip all over yourself again. Because the world wants to say things like, prove your worth. You can't. Well, do one of those mea culpa tours, you know. Go around telling everybody that you're sorry. Donate lots of money to people. No, church, how do I accept Jesus? 
I declare with my voice that Jesus is Lord. I acknowledge my sin. I am in the wrong. I acknowledge the righteousness of God. Only God is pure and good and holy and right. And I submit to the authority of God. I am not in charge of myself. You are my creator. I belong to you. And I do what Jesus said. Remember the lesson we talked about him being a good teacher? Show them what he said. Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And then, 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, and the new has come. You need new life. This old one is weighing you down. It is wearing you out. It is leaving you wanting. You need the life that only God can bring. And it only comes through Jesus. You can be born again. And so I die to myself. I do that in baptism. I'm born again. If you want to get into the nuances of the wise, fine. I'm just telling you. They just need to hear because that's what Jesus said. He said, be born again. And we understand that. This is what it means. You're baptized. You die to self. And when you come up, you are raised to life new, a child of God. You embrace the gift of the Holy Spirit. You invite it in. You say, take up Dwelling in me, I'm sorry for the condition I'm asking you to move into. But I can't do it on my own. I need God in me. Transforming me. Changing me. Helping me offer myself to the authority of God. Because I'm not going to want to do it. And I need someone greater than me in me. I need Christ in me. The Spirit in me helping me submit to the will of God. Does that sound about right? I forgot one thing I wanted to end on, though. It's not just ollie ollie oxen free. What you're signing up for. It's not just an e-ticket. Only some people even know what that is. It's not just, I get to go to heaven. You live in enemy-occupied territory now. And you're an ambassador of Jesus. And you don't have to be afraid of the world around you. Because you know what it is to fear God. Your life is His. That's the deal you made. And so now it's time to do the hard work, the reconciling work of Jesus. That's what we've signed up for. And when we take communion, we remember, don't we? We remember the death of Jesus for our sin. We remember his resurrection, his defeat of sin and death. But we don't just do it to make ourselves feel better. We do it because we proclaim we are the people of God. We are partaking in Jesus. We are the body, in fact, of Christ at work in this world. And so when you take communion today, church, I want to encourage you not only to remember what the bread is about, the body of Christ offered for your sin, and his blood that was shed 
the atonement for your sin, but also marking you, claiming you, anointing you as a child of God. But your response to that, use me. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gift of Jesus, for his body that was sacrificed in our place. We understand that he is the atoning sacrifice for our sin, that he is the scapegoat, that we are set free because of his willing sacrifice. And we pray as we take the bread that you would remind us today of his willing sacrifice and that we would seek to live life the way he has called us to. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. We'll pray for the cup. But I want to remind you that two of your elders will be at the back of the room. And that if your heart is in need of encouragement, strengthening, or celebration, that after you've taken the cup, if you want to be prayed with by one of them, they're right back there for you. While David sings the song, they're there waiting to encourage you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the blood of Christ, for the atonement for sin, and for being made your people. We pray, Father, that you would help us to bear him well as we seek to serve your kingdom this week. Help us to be a people dedicated to you. And as we take this cup again, we remember that we are participating in the work of Christ. In your son's name we pray. Amen.